Marketing is a podcast for business owners and leaders produced by my dad, Steve Davis, and his colleague at Talked About Marketing, David Olney, in which they explore marketing through the lens of their own four Ps, person, principles, problems, and perspicacity. Yes, you heard that correctly. Apart from their love of words, they really love helping people. So they hope this podcast will become a trusted companion on your journey in business. David, if I take a lot of cues from my different AI tools about what to think, do, say, when I look in the mirror and I have my internal dialogue, will I stop being me and start being an AI hybrid? I think it's only a danger if you don't have a pause between the stimulus and the response to go, that was a suggestion, but how am I going to use my discernment skill to decide if it makes me the person I want to be and makes me behave in the world in the way I want? As long as you've got that in there, you're a person making use of tools. In that case, I'm pausing... And now I'm ready to start the podcast. Our four P's. Number one, person. The aim of life is self-development. To realise one's nature perfectly. That is what each of us is here for. Oscar Wilde. David, I'm not sure if I've exposed you to my infatuation with a musical called A New Brain over the past few months at the time of recording, I reviewed a local production of it by Divine Productions and it seeped into every nerve and pore and fibre of my body. Did you get that or did you get protected from this? No, I I was protected from it, which seems really quite strange because normally we very excitedly tell each other about a new book or new music or new something. It actually came out a number of years ago, this musical, um, but uh, this was, I think, the first time it was possibly ever done here in South Australia and Divine Production do a magnificent job. It's a lovely story, uh, fun. Uh, William Finn's the man who actually is the playwright or the, the if you call him a playwright for a musical, piece of musical theatre and uh, he's a composer and, and story writer. It's a story of someone who has a, he's, he, he is a right, he wants to be a super Broadway musical writer and then, but to, to make ends meet, he has to write kids' so songs and he seems to be working for a tyrannical boss called Mr. Bungie who's like a frog character and a really horrible human or flesh frog. And uh, anyway, he has this brain thing that happens to him and he gets rushed to hospital and they're talking about having to drain stuff from his brain and he's thinking about if I get a new brain, am I going to be the same person, etc., etc. Great. It sounds pretty gory for a musical night of entertainment, but it is absolutely hilarious. And the reason I'm mentioning all of this in the person segment is David Gauchy. I had a chance to sit down with him for one of the other podcasts I create, the Adelaide Show podcast, um, because he's been running Divine Productions for 10 years here in South Australia, and we had a long chat about what it is to do well. They've got a very high standard in their community theatre company um, of the, the output they, they achieve, And as we got down to it, he talked about working with people and people may well be completely um, besotted by, um, I don't know, they might have their own Broadway heroes, like Jonathan Groff is a, a popular figure for many people. And when they're working with David, they say, I want to sound like him, I want to be like him. And David had this wise reflection, which I'll play for you now from the Adelaide show. Let's have a listen. I think what I love most about theatre is that we all recognise that we are imperfect Mm. and we don't actually, we don't focus, we don't search for perfection. What we search for is something real and tangible and I think that's what makes, I love theatre, like I love, and you know, 
I often say to people, uh, especially students, we're talking about Otacon, you talked about Otacon. You know, I'll get kids saying to me, oh, I want to sound like Jonathan Groff, or I want to sound like Sutton Foster, or I want to sound like Idina Menzel, or I want to sound... And I go, yeah, but have you actually listened to them? Have you listened to them? When you listen to them, you go, oh, that sounds... Oh, I was only... Oh, I said, but what you're hearing, it transcends mm. their voice. What they're bringing to this is they're bringing themselves wholly focused in that moment of performance and that's part of yeah. what one of the things that i say every time i work with a cast you know um will you make mistakes yep you're gonna make mistakes i make mistakes all the time it's not how you make mistakes it's how you move on from them it's how i mean it's how you recover but more importantly it's what you bring to that moment yeah. that counts and so there you go david uh Interesting. I remember when he was saying it at the time, I went, yeah, we think of someone like John Cleese I like, but if I was him and I actually dismantled everything about him, um, there probably are some stock standard things he's doing that we might call flaws that it just wouldn't be authentic for me to embody. What, what are you thinking about this from a person perspective? I really like it and it reminds me of when I was a guitarist in the 1990s and when you're learning, you're so busy listening to amazing people to go, oh, I wish I could play like that. And it's only coming back to guitar now that I've finally stopped trying to play like anyone else and play you know, like myself. But the strange thing is after so many years of teaching in universities and mentoring people in the business world now, the comment I constantly made to students and mentees is, you should be yourself, but find a part of yourself that is relevant to the situation because you want to be authentic because people can tell. But also in most situations, people don't want all of you. That's overwhelming. It's too complicated. They need the simplicity of a relevant part, but that relevant part has to be authentic. And that relevant part will quite possibly have some flaws, but flaws are what characterize uniqueness in a lot of cases like john cleese is very funny and very weird and very flawed so why not come up with your own version of those characteristics when we we're talking about this before we have a slight dilemma if we are totally ourselves every minute of the day it's probably not going to be overly socially acceptable in every situation so we still have to be judicious about how much of ourself we put out in different situations massively so i think this is something that now is such a problem everyone's been told you know in society that you can be you 100 percent you 100 percent of the time and it just doesn't work because people who are being 100 percent themselves all the time normally struggle to connect with everyone else who's being 100 percent themselves and look at the epidemic of loneliness and anxiety we live in as a consequence of people not understanding party manners that you can be yourself and make sure you fit the situation and the social milieu. On that note. Our four Ps. Number two, principles. You can never be overdressed or overeducated. Oscar Wilde. In the principal section uh, this particular episode, we, we normally have a great book that we like to dissect and share, uh, but this is one that you've just encountered, David, where uh, there's a book called Paradoxical Leadership, where you said the book was bad, but the concept is good. We, we need to explain this because this is a first for us, a book that we're not necessarily endorsing, but still has ideas of value. Absolutely. It was a book I was really looking forward to because you know, I've observed so many times that in so many situations, you can't pick between option A and option B because both of them are relevant. So you have to deal with the paradox of how do you do both, which may not fit together well, which you may not have quite enough resources for, which may be a real tap on your energy or ability to concentrate and think through the implications. And I, you know, I started the book going, oh, it's going to be at so many good things. And it just ended up being very complex and convoluted. We can talk about balancing polarities in your team, your organization, or even in society. But paradoxical leadership basically starts with yourself. Here are three tips. One, 
self-reflect. Explore which polarities have a major impact on your life and work. Is it the tension between seeking security and longing for great adventures? Or are you zigzagging between sticking to the plan and just going with the flow? This practice helps you to better understand your own unconscious patterns and give you full ownership of all sides of yourself, especially the sides that you feel uncomfortable with. Second, value the opposite side. Even when you strongly attached to a specific style or view or approach, know that it represents only one part of the story. Dare to explore sides of yourself and of others that you dislike or even find repulsive. What is despite their apparent negative form, the underlying positive intention and how can you transform it into something constructive? Third, surround yourself with people who are different and who are able and willing to contradict you and give you strong feedback. Listen while suspending your judgment, put your ego aside and create a safe environment where everything can be said. Allow others to challenge your ideas in order to reach a deeper level of understanding and creativity. More about this in my new book, Paradoxical Leadership. It just ended up being very complex and convoluted, but the thinking that came out of it was really valuable, and that is, I've often thought it's important to accept paradoxes, like the fact you want to do well at work, but you also need to put time into your family. You know, you want to do the thing that went well yesterday a little bit better, but you also need to find time to learn to do new things because things are not static, they change. So really reflecting on the, the things that weren't in the book really made me think that whenever possible, if you're leaning strongly to one of two options, leave a little bit of time and space for the second option because the fact that you were going back and forth between the two means there's merit in both. And even though it might seem easier initially to do one thing rather than both, you know, to focus you know, only on selling the product you've got now rather than putting some time and effort into developing the next product, for example. In reality, a balance between the two is going to keep your mind more flexible and more adaptable which is going to better prepare you for the complex world we live in. So the subtitle of this book is How to Make Complexity an Advantage. So Ivo uh, Brugmans, or Brumans, the author, is he arguing that you you need to choose one more than the other or you need to spread yourself across all of them? What's, what's he trying He's to do? He's arguing for at least always doing a couple of things and he tries to come up with a system that you can apply to work out which things to do and how to allocate resources. And I think he's trying to, you know, use a hammer to say everything is the same shape nail. Like to me, there's not enough nuance and subtlety. The paradox idea is awesome. The idea that there is a reliable system for working out how to manage them, I don't think is reliable. What is reliable is accepting there's a reason we struggle to decide between two things sometimes because we probably need to do both. And this is part of the reason for having people you trust and doing research to go, hang on, you know, bouncing ideas off of people you know, or using AI or doing research, all of these things to make you realize, well, I shouldn't choose. Choosing is the easy thing. Choosing is the black and white thing. But complexity can't be regulated into easy management. It kind of has to be accepted as the paradox it is. To be paradox specifically, we're talking about, uh, or the definition from uh, Merriam-Webster is a statement that is seemingly contradictory or opposed to common sense, and yet perhaps it's true, or a self-contradictory statement that at first seems true. And I feel like this we've gone into a great deal of detail chasing uh, some elusive insight from this where and and even the examples even talked about so far there, it's one thing if they were apples compared to apples and one was opposed to the other. But when it's apples and oranges, I'm not necessarily saying it's a paradox. But I guess it depends the on the parcel it's being wrapped up in. 
paradox is a convenient word that gets thrown out there to say, I don't want to deal with this complexity. Mm. You know, enough times in the academic setting, you know, sort of, or in senior management situations, I've heard people say, oh, it's a paradox. We can't resolve it. Literally kicking the can down the road. <laughs> So I think it's a word that gets misused, but really I think you've just got to the essence of it. We're comparing an apple and an orange, so why not make fruit salad? See, now I'm getting hungry. So let's, fruit let's, salad. Let's pause and get to the next segment so we can get ready for our end of season uh, little feast. Our four Ps. Number three, problems. I asked the question for the best reason possible. Simple curiosity, Oscar Wilde. In the problem segment this time, David, uh, I just wanted to reflect, given the fact that we've just launched our own AI short course, which is called the AI Obedience School, there was something on the AI front that I wanted to reflect on, and that is the increasing chatter uh, around some AI tools that are being used to, as as counsellors, uh, so you can actually think things out loud or, or sort things through with an AI. And we need, do need to get clarity in this world. And depending on the role that you're in, sometimes you don't feel like you've got, uh, you, you can't really talk because the people around you, they're not paid enough to bother. They don't have the same skin in the game, which is what we talked about many, many episodes ago with the uh, puzzles, problems, and messes uh, conundrum. And so if we do start blurting out our inner selves and taking a lead from AI, is it us? Are we becoming hybrid beings, David? Let's just tease this apart briefly because it's going to be something that I think will raise its head a little bit more, especially as at the time of recording, the latest iteration of uh, ChatGPT has upped its ability to have uh, just live back and forth human conversation, in inverted commas, uh, with its AI machine. Yeah, it's getting to the point where it's getting harder and harder to build the pause in between the stimulus and the response, where if the AI provides something reasonable, you know, so quickly, it's so easy to go, that's reasonable, and just continue acting like it, it's providing authoritative information. In terms of, you know, AI being able to provide some form of counselling, we're really moving into the territory of, you know, what people talk about as almost next generation AI, which is talking about AI agents, you know, an AI very specifically tailored to do one task particularly well and the task of a counselor is never to tell you what to do but to help you reflect on things you might want to do so you know it seems to me you know where i do so much mentoring as part of what we do here at talked about marketing with people it's a big ask to say that you can help someone to reflect on the right things so they can make a more informed decision from a broader perspective now, as a person, I help people do that all the time. And I don't doubt that within a year's time, the AI will probably be able to do a half-decent job of this. But will it say the same thing that you and I would say? And that is, you know, I'm here to put ideas in front of you, but it's your responsibility to reflect on them and to make your own decision for your own reasons. You know, I can't guide you to make the best decision for you. I can guide you to make a broader decision that takes more things into consideration. So this and is I just wonder mm -hmm. how much the AI will be able to provide that degree of subtlety. We well, see if you were talking to a human, uh, people do tend to back in their favourite horse, and they will stick to mm -hmm. that, uh, which we've touched on before. Uh, with the AI, supposedly it doesn't get that vice-like grip on its position. And if we learn the discipline when it says something of knowing that if we hear something that we kind of like or it's what we want to hear, we won't try to criticise it, we'll accept it. It's only mm -hmm. when we hear something that we don't want to, like cut down on alcohol or something, uh, that's when we'll say, hang on a minute. Uh, um, if we got into the habit in these conversations of saying to our AI tools, like, that's interesting. Could you please now give me the contra argument, the counter argument to mm. what you just said? And let's be the devil's advocate to your proposition. Maybe then we have a chance to work in, in much better tandem with it so that we, 
we do force ourselves to think things through in a, in a tricky way. And it being an AI will hopefully play that with a straight bat on either side of the argument. Yeah, if it can help us to become our own devil's advocates because it gives us the experience of going, well, I've made that case for you. You've responded in this way, but now I'm going to make the you know the contrary case for you so that you can think about that as well. The, the potential there as a tool to help people to learn to think more broadly and deeply could be amazing if you know produced the right way. Yeah. Look, I, over summer, at the time of this going out, we're heading towards the Australian summer. People get a chance to stop and reflect. I, I bet some people will be playing with AI tools if that's you. Um, have a go with that. I'll, I'll be doing it too when I talk to Ember, which is the name of my little AI voice, of even setting up, setting up as rules. I'd like to have a conversation with you now, and as we go, I'd like you to, to stop every now and then and ask me if I would like the counter position to be put forward. I think that's actually a bright way forward. If only humans were good at doing that, we would be in a much better uh space as far as a race is concerned. Our four Ps. Number four, perspicacity. The one duty we owe to history is to rewrite it. Oscar Wilde. Finally, perspicacity, and this is the end of series three in which we took this segment of you know, thinking about how we think, and we applied it to David Sandler's amazing book on sales, You Can't Teach a Kid to Ride a Bike at a Seminar. And we've gone through the seven steps of the Sandler submarine. So now it's just time for a few quick closing thoughts. So, David, can I ask you if um, if someone has listened to those segments and they want to start throwing or popping their toe into the pond to play with some of David Sandler's ideas, and by the way, if this is the first episode you've heard, please go back and listen to the previous episodes in Series 3 uh, where we've gone through his book in great detail, where would you suggest they start? What are some starting strategies? I think an important thing for everyone to think about is if you are going to be in a sales or marketing setting, then you need to to use Sandler's submarine, you know, as the seven steps in the order it is and do them properly. Because in a, a corporate commercial setting, it works in its entirety brilliantly. But that doesn't mean you can't use the idea of building rapport, future contract, learning to talk to people about pain, learning to use his tricks about, well, not his tricks, learning to use his skills about how to talk about money and budget in a gentler way, admitting that you're uncomfortable. There's so many good tools that you can use individually in Sandler Submarine you know, in your life. But if you're going to use it in a commercial setting, please use the pieces in order and don't move on until you finish the first step, then do the second step, finish it properly, and then move on. Because the system only works if it's seen in its in entirety in a commercial setting. Yes, and it's been heartening as I've been working with people in various mentoring programs I'm part of, um, the ASBAS one and uh, Women in Business and Charles Sturt Council, etc. And today, at the time of recording, a woman I was working with said, oh, yeah, that would refer to that step in the sand submarine of the upfront contract. I think that's what I'm doing there. Mm. And other people, we've found the talk about pain, the pain step, really helpful. So I think you're right. I think, and here's the paradox, <laughs> if I want to use the term lazily, uh, you can pick and choose like a smorgasbord uh, for bits of help along the way. But if you are doing this as your calling, then he, his whole case is that you need to do these steps and you need to do them in order. A little bit of discipline now to use the system properly will pay off when you can adapt in the moment to the person you're interacting with because the steps are so familiar and when to move on and how to move on has become second nature. So if you need you know, to use the Sandler submarine as a complete skill set, start practicing now because the sooner you start, the sooner you'll lock it in and it will just be there when you need it. All right. Well, let's set sail now uh, to say goodbye to Series 3 of Talking About Marketing. And perhaps should we finish with the Beatles uh, version of uh, Yellow Submarine? Uh, you know, we all sell in the Sandler Submarine. Should we finish like that, David? Are you ready? Are you up for it? I am more than happy to let you sing that because I'm just going to chuckle quietly. Oh, come on. 
We all sail oh, in the sandless submarine. The sandless submarine. The sandless submarine. Yeah, it's falling to bits sinking. completely. <laughs> Man overboard. Torpedo oh. on the left bow. Thank you for listening to Talking About Marketing. If you enjoyed it, please leave a rating or a review in your favorite podcast app. And if you found it helpful, please share it with others. Steve and David always welcome your comments and questions, so send them to podcast at talkedaboutmarketing.com. And finally, the last word to Oscar Wilde. There's only one thing worse than being talked about, and that's not being talked about.